Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. This week, we're going to look at scriptures from Proper 22. Proper 22. Now, last week, we looked at 2 Kings, 1 Corinthians, and Matthew. And we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. One of the things that's nice about the Daily Office Lectionary is you get a good stream of consciousness, if you will, learning, study over books of the Bible because they stay with them for a while. Acts, we had a, over, the, over the summertime, is very long. We, we, we look at a lot of books in Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we, we look at the whole books. Um, and a lot of times in the letters, we don't look at every single verse uh, in the letters of Paul, but we look at some key scriptures, so we'll do the same thing again. Well, let's start right in. 2 Kings chapter 20, I talked about Hezekiah last week. Hezekiah was a great king of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Judah has two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, in case you were wondering. In those days, Hezekiah became ill, verse 1, and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to him. This is the prophet that's in the book of the prophets. This is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you will die and you will not recover. That is what God told him. So Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed. It's a good thing to do. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. He was a very faithful man. Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord your God says. I've heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. Heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple, and I will add 15 years to your life. So God added 15 years to Hezekiah's life. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. Remember, we talked about the king of Assyria last time. He took the people of the northern kingdom into captivity, into bondage. But he rescued, he, God, rescued Judah, Hezekiah's leadership, rescued them from Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. So David was associated with the southern kingdom, Judah, and he tells him what to do. Let's look at 2 Kings 21. Now this is a very interesting thing. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. So Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah did die in 15 years. And he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. 55 years. That's a long time. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. So Hezekiah did a great job, was a great leader, saved Israel from the Assyrians in captivity. His son Manasseh was terrible. Not only was he terrible, he was terrible for 55 years. God kept him there for 55 years. And he did the opposite of what Hezekiah had done. So instead of continuing to do good, he he did evil. Do you see the influence that a leader has? He erected altars to Baal. He made an Asherah pole as Ahab, the king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord. This is verse 4 of 21, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. Yikes! Practiced sorcery and divination and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to to anger. So much for the son passing it on to the father, passing it on to the son, and the son behaving like the father. So much for a great leader and following him as another great leader. So much for that leadership of the of the evil leader being short. It actually was long. The people did not listen. Verse nine. Manasseh led them astray so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. The Lord said to the, through his servants, the prophets, in verse uh, 10, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. These detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into the sin with these idols. 
Wow. I'm going to bring such disaster, God says, on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. The consequences of Israel against Israel were profound. Let's look at chapter 22. Now we go back to a good king, an extraordinarily good king. His name was Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. Now, read the end of chapter 21. You'll see how Josiah comes about. And what happened is the book of the law was found. The book of the law, he tore his robes in verse 11 when it was found. And some very good things happened because the people were not obeying the book, but now they found the book, Deuteronomy. They found it, and he began to read the book of the law. Okay, verse 20, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. Josiah in verse, in chapter 23, he renews the covenant. He read in their hearing all the books of the word of the book of the covenant, the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. And the people pledged themselves to the covenant. So this is a great example of a situation in Israel that had become desperate with Manasseh. Did well under Hezekiah, then retreated into profound sin and disobedience. Josiah comes along and restores the covenant. They found the covenant. They found the book regarding the covenant. He begins to read it. People have then knowledge of it, and they respond in a positive way to it. And many positive things began to happen to Israel. I'm sorry, Judah, which would be southern Israel, if you will, in terms of location. Verse 25 of chapter 23. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king after him who turned to the Lord as he did with all of his heart and with all of his soul and with all of his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. Deuteronomy. He had the law of Moses. He read it. He kept it. He led the people well. In the keeping of the law of Moses, people responded. When the people respond to the Lord, when you and I respond to the Lord, positive things happen. When we do not respond to the Lord, think about Manasseh and what happened. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away from the heat of his fierce anger, verse 26, which he burned against Judah because of all that Manasseh had done to provoke him to anger. Remember Manasseh? So the Lord said, I will remove Judah from my presence as I removed Israel. And I will reject Jerusalem, the city I chose, and this temple about which I said, there my name shall be. So you don't want to offend the Lord. You do not want to provoke the Lord to anger. Chapter 24. During Jehoiakim's reign, Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land and Jehoiakim, became his vassal for three years. And you see, now they're descending deeply into the abyss. This is 24. The Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him. He sent them to destroy Judah. This is God. In accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed to his servants, the prophets. Remember the prophets are the ones that are speaking these words. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because... Of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of his innocent blood. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. There's so much, and then there's judgment. And so we go to Jeremiah. We finish off Saturday. See this on your post, Jeremiah 35, 1 to 19. So go and find Jeremiah in your Bible, one of the prophets. Jeremiah 1 through 19. Again and again, he says in 15, I send my prophets to you. Each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. So God is sending the prophets like Jeremiah, Isaiah. He's sending them to these people to reform your ways. Each of you must turn from your wicked ways, reform your actions. Do not follow other gods to serve them. Then you will live in the land I've given to you and your fathers, but you paid no attention or listened to me. Where have we heard that before? It's throughout the Bible. We need to listen to what God says. We need to turn to God. 
and we will then live and be blessed. If we do not do that, we will have major problems. Look at what uh, verse, uh, let's see, 17 says. I'm going to bring on Judah and everyone living in Jerusalem every disaster I pronounced against them. I spoke to them, but they did not listen. I called to them, but they did not answer. Wow, that's a lot to think about. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's have a sober reading of the ending of the kings uh, and through the prophets. Very profound work there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We were in chapter 10 last time. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. This is 1014 to 111. And so there's some wonderful reading about that. He says in uh, verse 23, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. That is a great summation of the whole thing. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews or Greeks or the church of God even as I try to please everybody in every way. I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved. Follow me, he says, as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 2, 17 to 22. Back to the Lord's Supper again. And the importance of the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus, verse 23 On the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Beautiful reading about the Lord's Supper, and I know the different denominations have different views about the Lord's Supper and how it's practiced. Just wanted to bring to your remembrance, if you've forgotten the scripture, or to your understanding, and just looking at your Bible and reading your Bible, if you've not seen the scripture, it's a very powerful scripture about Holy Communion. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we see on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in your post, we have a discussion about spiritual gifts. Now, spiritual gifts are to be used for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. Everyone that is in the body of Christ is important and has gifts for ministry. Why do they have gifts for ministry? So that the body can be built up. So that you and I can prosper, be blessed, be instructed, be disciplined, be guided, be challenged, um, be instructed in such a way as that we can grow in Christ. Can one person do all those things? No. This is why he, Paul, talks about the gifts that are given, and we see this in 12. Verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works through all of them in all people. So God is working, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, present, Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there's given, and then he lists gifts of the Spirit. Verse 11. All of these are the work of the same Spirit. He gives to each person just as he determines. So it's the Holy Spirit giving you and me the gifts for ministry to be used not for ourselves, not for the building of ourselves, not for our own self-importance and self-good, if you will, but for the body of Christ and the building of God's kingdom. Now, this is about the kingdom of God, folks. This is not about the kingdom of man. This is about the supernatural working of God in the church for the glory of God. It's not about my personal agenda as the head of a church. It's not what I want to happen. It's what God wants to happen. And he blesses people and gives them gifts to do it. And then so he goes on to talk about the body is not made of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, verse uh, 15, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It would not be for that reason. It would not be for that reason to cease to be part of the body. The ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. Okay. 
If the whole body were an eye, verse 17, where would the sense of hearing be? See, we need them all. We need the ear, we need the eye, we need the toe, we need the foot, we need the liver, we need the toe, we need the elbow, we need the mouth, we need the eyes, we need all of them. If they were all one part, where would the body be? Verse 19, verse 20. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Everybody's important. Everybody's needed. It makes a coherent whole, all for the glory of God. Okay? Okay. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Verse 27. You are important. You are significant. Use your gifts for the upbuilding of the body and for the glory of God. Again, another beautiful scripture that the Lord has given us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Very good for the church. Let's go back to Matthew. Now, Jesus has given us the Sermon on the Mount. He is doing ministry. He is healing. He is raising the dead. He is doing marvelous things. Why is he doing that? Because that's what God does. God heals. God blesses. The other thing that's happening is that God wants people to have a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, so that we may be saved. So he's showing his extraordinary power, his extraordinary wisdom, his extraordinary presence, and we are, by God's grace, to be drawn to him and submit our lives to him. Matthew 8, 28. 8, 28. Well, you have the healing of two demon-possessed men. The devils are talking to Jesus. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Verse 29. You're here to torture us? They knew that Jesus was greater. Demons are real. The supernatural evil is real. Their job is to make sure that you don't know that they're real and that you don't believe in them. The only power that's greater than that supernatural power is Jesus Christ himself, and he illustrates this in the profound reading at the end of chapter 8 of Matthew. In chapter 9, he heals the paralytic. So he's healing demon-possessed people. Now he heals somebody who is paralyzed. He also shows us his power to forgive sins, which they found to be highly objectionable and impossible. How can this man forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Yes, only God can forgive sins. Therefore, he must be God. Yes, he is. He turns out to be the Messiah, but they don't see that. Remember all those scriptures I read in the Old Testament the last couple of weeks? They would not listen. The prophet spoke to them. They could not hear what he was saying. Same thing is happening to Jesus. Jesus is speaking the truth. The prophet spoke the truth. The people would not hear. The lack of the people hearing caused tremendous problems in their own lives and in the nation's life. Jesus, again, illustrates his greatness in chapter 9, 1 through 8. In 9 to 17, we have the calling of Matthew, who became one of his apostles. And, of course, he wrote the book of Matthew. They questioned Jesus about fasting. It's one of the things they love to do is to ask him questions. And then Jesus would wrangle out of the questions. I'm saying that kind of in a uh, mocking way. Jesus knew exactly what was going on and was able to answer the questions, but they really didn't want to hear his answers. They wanted to entrap him. And of course, he knew that that's what they were doing. When you come to Jesus, you want to listen to what he has to say. You want to be aware of what he's saying. You want to be willing to learn. And then once you've heard what Jesus is saying, you want to respond to him in kind. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. Verse 18, the dead girl and sick woman. Now, remember when he talked about him calming the wind and the waves? So he can heal paralytics. He can take care of demon-possessed people. He calls people to himself. And now he's got a dead person. And the woman that was sick, she'd been bleeding for 12 years. She touches the edge of his cloak. Verse 20 and 21, your faith has healed us. Healed you, Jesus says. She was healed at that very moment of a disease that she had for a very, very long time. Jesus enters the ruler's house. Go away, the, de- the girl is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him. The crowd had been put outside. He went in, took the girl by the hand. News about him spread throughout the whole region. He raised someone the dead. They laughed at him. They mocked him. You want some more? Uh, 27 to 34. He heals 
the blind and the dumb. Touches the man's eyes, his sight was restored. While they were going out, a man who was demons possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. The demon was driven out. Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. The Pharisees missed it completely. They said in verse 34, it's by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. That's impossible. As smart as they were, and as religious they were, they missed Jesus completely, the Pharisees. Look at what he's doing. Finally, the workers, he goes throughout the villages and the towns. He teaches in their synagogues. He preaches the good news of the kingdom. He heals every disease and every sickness. Wow. He calls the 12 disciples to himself in chapter 10. He gives them authority to drive out evil spirits and cure every kind of disease and sickness. So now Jesus is taking his authority and his power, and he's giving it to his 12 disciples, and they're going out, the 12 apostles, I'm sorry, the 12 disciples, 12 apostles, and they are going out and doing ministry. He's not just doing it for himself. Remember, we said this in 1 Corinthians 12. We each have gifts. God uses them for the upbuilding, uses them and us for the upbuilding of his kingdom. The glory of God is a curse. It's not for our own self. These 12 apostles are not using this for their own selves. They are, by the grace of God, doing what God says, and people are being healed, being set free, and hearing the gospel. That's why you're here, in order for that to happen. What a great series of scriptures this week. I hope you enjoy them. And as I like to say, there's much self-reflection and prayer, great learning. Listen closely to what the Holy Spirit is telling you as you read these scriptures as the week progresses. God bless you abundantly, and we'll see you next week, Proper 23.